Hello and welcome to the BYU Library Family History Webinar. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Olivia Tuller and I'll be your host for this webinar. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You are welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments, insights, and questions. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar is on February 1st with James Tanner. He will be giving a presentation on how to fix damaged photos. If you would like to access the previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from Larry Jensen on understanding German cultural background. This is the fifth lecture of a 10 part series on German research. You can watch the first four parts of the series on our YouTube page. This is a pre-recorded lecture with no Q&A section. Before we begin, here's a little bit about Larry. He has a Bachelor of Science from Brigham Young University and is the author of A Genealogical Handbook of German Research. He is the co-author of Maps of the German Empire of 1871 and co-editor of German Genealogical Digest. He is now retired with 35 years work experience with the Salt Lake Family History Library. And we'll now turn the time over to Larry's lecture. Welcome to Lecture 5 in a series of 10 lectures on German genealogical research. This lecture is on understanding the German cultural background. Germany's history and culture have continually impacted each other. In this lecture, I will be covering the following topics. The beginning slide number for each topic is given on the right. Cultural information often results from governmental and jurisdictional changes laws and decrees affecting records and culture, and historical events such as wars, famines, plagues, foreign influence, etc., that led to the creation of records and cultural changes. The following are some of the resources that can provide not only historical facts, but also cultural information. They include published histories, historical atlases, encyclopedias, periodicals, and the internet. The following are some of the major historical events that we talked about in webinar number four. All of these had a cultural impact on the people and their records, some more than others. They included Germanic and Slavic tribal period that affected languages and culture, the establishment of Christianity, the Reformation, the Thirty Years' War that destroyed and changed areas, the French Revolution and its occupation occupation of Germany resulted in the influence of a foreign culture. The Industrial Revolution caused the population movement. The failed German Revolution from nobility rule caused an increase of immigration to foreign countries. The establishment of the German Empire of 1871 and the World War I and World War II caused the loss of population and a change in geographical areas. The establishment of German given names and surnames. First, foreknomen or given names were Germanic and established before the 5th century. They were often formed by combin combining two words like Gott for God and Lieb for love to form Gottlieb. Second, binomen or nicknames were established before written records. They were often derived from occupations, localities, and a person's physical description. Third, later, these nicknames became permanent familial nomina or surnames. Names and localities may be written phonetically. In Germany, record keepers such as ministers, civil registrars, census takers, etc., often recorded names of people and places phonetically. The problem comes from the fact that some letters and combination of letters are phonetically the same. The following are some of these. When a recorder asked a person to pronounce his name, he would record it the way it sounded to him. The following is an example of how names of an individual changed based on how they were pronounced or interpreted by the recorder. In 1267, this person's name was recorded as Johann Theloni Arius. In 1278, it was just Johann Zolderer. In 1285, it was recorded as Johann, our solar and fellow citizen. 
In 1286, it was changed to Johann Dictus, meaning called Zollner. In 1289, it repeated the name of Johann called Zollera. And in 1303, his death record gave his name again as Johann called Zoller. The following is an example of phonetics found in German records and resources. This resource was compiled by Inga Auerbach and Otto Fröhlich about the German Hessen mercenary troops that fought for England in the American Revolutionary War. This book is just one of six volumes. This volume lists Conrad Drill or Trill. The D and T are phonetically interchangeable. It means that it was listed sometimes as drill and sometimes as trill. The record in indicated that in 1773, when he joined the military, he was 14 years old. He would have been considered an adult after his church confirmation, which occurred ages between 13 and 17. It also means that he would have been born about 1759. His place of birth is given as Longen, and at that time, Longen belonged to the Landgrave of Hessen Castle. This is the birth entry for Johann Conrad. In the birth entry, Wilhelm Durerl, the father, is listed first. You'll notice that the last name is spelled D-R-O-Umlaut-L-L -L, with a D instead of a T and with the umlauted O instead of an I. Phonetically, it's the same as drill and trill. The child's name, Johann Conrad, is given at the bottom of the entry. In another example, family records identified an ancestor's place of birth as Stephansberg in Bavaria. A search of the Myers Gazetteer did not show a town listed by that spelling. A search was then made for the following phonetically similar spellings. All of them were negative, except Stephansberg in the district of Oberbayern, spelled with a PH instead of an F. So why is an understanding of phonetics important? Failure to understand phonetics in the use of given names, surnames, and locality names could result in the dead ending of an ancestral line by tracing a wrong line or searching in a wrong locality. People often want to know where their surname came from, why certain given names were chosen, and why they were often passed on generation after generation. The following are some of the factors that influenced the establishment of surnames and given names. Before the Middle Ages, single names were used exclusively. Often a second given name or nickname was added to differentiate between individuals with the same given name and these were later used as surnames. Given names were first used as surnames in the 1100s. The first ones were Germanic in form. Later, Christian names were introduced. Other factors included dynastical names of German monarchs that included such names as Konrad, Rudolf, Heinrich, and Friedrich appeared next. As Latin became the common language of the church, it also affected the form of surnames as shown in the following German to Latin names. The surname Becker became Pistorius. Keller became Celiarius. A handout giving names from German to Latin and Latin to German is included with this lecture. Latin nicknames became a popular attachment to the surname, such as in 1330 in Strasbourg, a person by the name of Gerhardus Siebenschilling was called Pater Noster. In 1485 at Leonberg, a Caspar Schneider was called Diermeyer. It should be noted that the Germanic language was preserved in the speech of the German farmers. Given names based on nobility areas included the following popular forms. Examples of Prussian given names included Friedrich, Wilhelm, Friedrich Karl, and Albrecht. Examples of Saxon given names included August, Johann, and Albert. Hanover typical given names included Ernst and August. This may add verification as to the area of Germany an ancestor was from, but by itself it does not prove it. Historical influences on given names. During the Reformation, Old Testament given names became popular 
especially names like David, Isaac, Samuel, and Daniel, because of the Counter-Reformation, given names reverted back to Christian names. Use of multiple given names increased until 1685. In that year, the Magdeburg Church Ordinance was passed. It limited the number of given names to two. By the 1800s, multiple given names again became popular. Because of feudalism, there was, a li there was little if any population movement between nobility areas. In the Turingen area at one time, there were 286 families by the name of Greiner. Of the children of the families, there were 12 Albans, 12 Adolfs, 20 Annals, 10 Carls, 13 Eliases, 23 Maxes, and 20 Ottos. Think of the difficulty the ministers must have had keeping christening, confirmation, marriage, and death records straight as to who belonged or was related to whom. In the, the case where two fathers had the same given name and surname, the minister would also identify them by their occupation. To make it easier to identify their children, they began giving their children additional middle names. In this area, there were also 139 Mueller families. On one of the Mueller family pedigree charts, the following generations were listed beginning with the earliest ancestor as Max Mueller. His son's name was Armin, who added the nickname Mueller Mops. Armin's son became known with another nickname of Fernando Mueller Mopsmeister, and his son, who is the latest generation, added the nickname of Elias Mueller Mopsmeister Fernando Ballard. Given names changes of, par of parents, changes in the husband's given name. In the parish christening record in Mural Lauenburg Schleswig Holstein, it shows that a child was born on 20 April 1783 by the name of Johann Christian Otta. In 1812, at the age of 29, he was married as Johann Peter Christian Otta. In the birth record of his four children, he was recorded as. Johann Friedrich Otta. Johann's wife's name is shown in her birth record, their marriage record, and in the birth records of her first two children was Katharina Margarita Bentin. But she was listed as Katharina Dorothea Bentin in the birth records of her last two children. Their second child was listed as Anna Dorothea Elizabeth in her birth record but listed as Anna Margarita Elizabeth three months later in her death record. It seems like they changed their names like they changed their clothes. When you have two men with the same surname and similar given names having children in the same time period and parish, make sure you verify their ancestor, the ancestor by matching him with the correct spouse, occupation, and place. I talked earlier about how given names could be used to identify potential German locations where they were found. The same can be said about German surname forms. Two major influences on names had to do with being Germanic or Slavic and High and Low German. Germanish cultural background concerning surnames stems from its tribal period shaping its diverse cult cultures. This outline map has a horizontal and a vertical line that divide Germany into four cultural areas. A copy of this is provided as one of the handouts for this lecture. The vertical line separates the Germanic culture in the West from the Slavic culture in the East. As mentioned in the previous lecture, when Charlemagne became emperor in 800 AD, he stopped the advancement of the Slavic tribes and established the following cultural background, shown here with a red line. This is one of the handouts for this lecture. The first column is an alphabetical list of the nobility and provincial areas of the 1871 German Empire. The middle column identifies the Germanic tribes that were in these areas, and the last column identifies the Slavic tribes in these areas. The horizontal line separates the area in the north where the Low German is spoken from the area in the south where High German is spoken. This line in black may appear to be very exact, but it's not. High German is subdivided into the upper German in blue in the south and the central German in green. 
Low German Dutch is yellow in the north. It was this low German area that the Germanic tribes, mostly the Angles and the Saxons, who invaded England in 450 AD were from and from which the English language originated. This chart shows that the high German area made a consonant shift. The first column shows the consonants and how they shifted. The second column gives examples and the third column identifies the Germanic areas. For example, the consonant P became a double F, as in the change of the word ship to shift, as found in the upper and central areas. And the P also became a PF, as in the change of the word apple from, to opful, found in the upper area. Low German areas did not undergo a shift of consonants, and in grammar the perfect participle is not formed with a prefix. This chart gives a comparison between Low German, High German, and English. This indicates that words can be the same, but the meaning is different. Buck in High German means Burkhard. Bulk in Low German means Burkhard. Bulk in High German means Ziegenbock or a ram. Buck in Low German means Ziegenbock. The following shows the influence of High and Low German on German names. It shows Johann Kurze in High German be, is Hans Korte in Low German. Johann Kleintrup in High German is Johann Kleintrup in Low German. Jakob Kleinen in High German is Jakob Kleinen in Low German. If you have dead ended on an ancestral line, you may want to determine where your town or parish is in relation to the High German and Low German boundary lines. On this map, the Low German and High German areas are separated by a red line. In this example, a person whose Low German name was Johann Valentin Bula moved from the Low German city of Vonhausen to the High German city of Kassel. The records show that his name was changed to the High German name form of Johann Valentin Powell. An ancestor does not have to move to a different area to be affected by the change. If the ancestral parish is in a low German area and the record offices containing ancestral information such as court, military, district, and county records are in a high German area, your ancestor's name could be affected. Resources on German surnames. Many excellent resources on German surnames are available. They provide an etymology of the name and show variations. These are a few of them. Joseph Karlmann Brechemacher has two books. One is the Deutsche Zippenamen, or the German family names, and the Etymologische Wörterbuch der Deutschen Familiennamen, which is the etymology dictionary of German surnames. Max Gottschalt's book is Deutsche Namenkunde. Albert Heinze's book is the Deutschen Familiennamen. There is a German saying, tell me your name and I will tell you where you are from. Next, we will talk about the establishment of German and given names. Going back to the map showing the cultural division of German surnames, we will talk about name forms found in the four cultural areas. Another handout for this lecture is titled Name Forms. It identifies the name forms used in different areas of Germany. The first half of the handout is an alphabetical list of the name forms, what type of form it is, and the areas of the German Empire it is found in. For example, the AI was changed from EI this was a dialect change found in the Prussian province of Hessen-Nassau, giving the example of the name Heinz from Heinz. The second half of the handout lists the four different areas, the Northwest, Southwest, Northeast, and Southeast. It then gives the nobility or provincial areas found in them and the name of the forms that they have. Here it shows that in the Northwest cultural area, in the geographical area of the Frisian, patronymic names are found. It shows that when the letter S is added to the given names like Gerd and Harm, it changes them to the surnames of Gerds and Harms. 
In this area, occupation names such as Schmidt, Baker, Mueller, Fisher, and Shipper were used. Combinations of consonants and vowels were also used in names such as the SM in Schmidt, the TJ in Varntius, the double K in Decker, the UI in Lutians, and the OU in Wildeborg. The lines divide the map into the following cult four cult different cultural areas. In the northwest area is Germanic Low German. In the southwest area is Germanic High German. In the northeast area is Germanic Slavic Low German. And in the southeast area is Germanic Slavic High German. The following slides describe each cultural area showing what name forms exist for each. Beginning with the northwest area, it includes the areas of Schleswig Holstein, Oldenburg, Hanover North, or North Rhineland, Friesian, Lippe, and Westfalen. The following are the surname forms for Schleswig Holstein and Oldenburg, with examples for both. These are the surname forms used for Hanover and Northern Rhineland. The surname forms for Eastern Hanover, formerly called Ostfalen, are similar to Westfalen. Surname forms in Western Hanover include the Frisian area. The last name forms for this area are Lippe and Westfalen. The Southwest name forms include the areas of Baden, Bayern, Hessen, Nassau, Hessen, Rhineland, Thuringen, and Württemberg. These are the surname forms for Baden and Southern Rhineland. The surname forms for Hessen and Northern Hessen, Nassau are nearly the same. Hessen Nassau South had a vowel change, and Thuringen is similar to the Hessen areas. The difference between Bayern and Bayern West are the vowel, consonants, suffix, and locality usage. This last one shows the surname forms for Württemberg. The Northeast surname forms include Brandenburg, Mecklenburg, Ostpreußen, Pommern, Posen North, Schleswig Holstein East and Westpreußen. The surname forms for East and Schleswig Holstein are primarily, primarily Slavic. The following are some of the common surnames found in Mecklenburg. Patronymic names in Mecklenburg are similar to those in Eastern Schleswig Holstein. The areas of Hinterpommern, which is the area east of the Oder River, Vorpommern area west of the Oder River, and Brandenburg have the following surname forms. The last surname forms for this area are found in Westpreußen, Ostpreußen, and Posen. The southeast surname forms for this area included Eastern Bavaria, Southern Brandenburg, Posen, Saxon Prussia, Saxon Kingdom, Schlesien, and Thuringen. The following are the Eastern Bavarian surname forms. These are the surname forms for, for both Turingen and Saxon Kingdom. The last area with surname forms are Brandenburg and Schlesien. In this German Slavic area, church records could be recorded entry could record entries in either the German or the Slavic languages. For, for example, a person could be identified in the German language as Johann Hofmann from Bautzen or in the Slavic language as Jan Dvornik from Budison. The establishment and use of calendars. Beginning with the Julian calendar, it was established at the time of Julius Caesar in 46 BC. It was not used in the Germanic and Slavic areas until after the, the establishment of Christianity. Catholics used the Julian calendar up until 1582, and the Protestants used it up until 1700. The establishment of Christianity. So when when was Christianity established in the various areas of Germany? This chart is one of the handouts for this lecture. It shows the nobility in provincial areas of Germany and the century in which Christianity was first established. Using the Julian calendar. This marriage record is a good example of how dates can be misinterpreted when using this calendar. The date of the first marriage entry is the 7th of August. The second entry is the 30th of Octobrus. 
And the third entry is the 14th of Noinbris. To, to understand these dates, we need to know how the months in the year were named. The month of January was named after the Roman god Janus. The month of February comes from the Latin word of Februm, which means purification. During the month, during this month, people focus on purifying themselves in preparation for the month of March. At that time, March, which was named after the Roman god Mars, was the first month of the year. The month of, of April was named after the Roman goddess Aphrodite. The month of May was named after the Roman goddess Maya. And June was named after the Roman goddess Juno. The next month was July named after the Roman Emperor Julius Caesar, and the month of August was named after the Roman Emperor Augustus. The next four months were given the names of numbers, because March was the first month of the year, August was the sixth month, September was the seventh month, and was named after the Latin word septum, meaning seven. October was named after the word, the Latin word octo, meaning eight. The month of November was named after the Latin word novum, meaning nine. And the month, the month of December was named after the Latin word decim, meaning ten. Going back to the marriage record, we now see that the first entry is the 7th of August. But the second entry, written as 30 octobers, is the 30th of October. The third entry, written as 14 Noinbris, is the 14th of November. One major issue resolved by the Catholic Church was the establishment of the Gregorian calendar in 1582. Catholic parishes changed the new calendar as soon as they learned of it, but it took time for the information to reach every parish, and the majority of Protestants did not accept it until after 1700. This chart, another handout for this lecture, shows the various localities and areas when they began using the Gregorian calendar. The area of Preussen or Prussia began using the new calendar in 1612, when the 22nd of August was followed by the 2nd of September. Using the Lutheran parish records for the city of Königsberg, East Prussia, we will look up the christening record of a Bartholomew's Benikin, Based on his age at death, he should have been born in 1611 or 1612. In this christening record, the year 1612 is given at the top of the page. Entries 121, 122, and 123 were for the 17th, 19th, and 20th of August. Entry 124 at the bottom is September 2nd. Below the date is a circle with a dot in the middle. The days of the week are represented by a symbol. The symbol of a circle with the dot in the middle is a symbol for Sunday. Below this symbol, it says, Calendar Gregorian. The christening entry is for a Bartholomew, the son of Michaelis Benikin. Deciphering Feast, Saint, and Other Religious Dates Church records also contained other dates called feast dates. These are religious holidays. The following are two types of feast dates. One is a fixed feast date, which occurs on the same date of the, of the year. Christmas, which always occurs on December 25th, is an example of a fixed feast date. The second is a movable feast date, which occurs on a certain day of the year. Easter is an example of this. It always occurs on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox, and because of this, it occurs on a different date each year. Almost all of these movable feast days occur on a Sunday and are identified by the name of the feast day or the Sunday it either before or after Easter. Included with this lecture is a handout titled Guide for, Def for, Defining, Guide for Finding the Date of Movable Feast Days that helps you convert a movable feast date to a calendar date. The row highlighted in red gives the heading of the columns for the year of the J, J. Julian calendar and the G. Gregorian calendar. After the year 1700, the J. Julian calendar is not 
listed because both Catholics and Protestants are using the Gregorian calendar. Deciphering feast dates. In a Christian record for 1773, the following date was given. Dominicus 16 post Trinitatis, or the 16th Sunday after Trinity. The following steps using this handout will show how to change this feast date into a regular calendar date. Step 1. Find the year 1773 listed on the first or second page of the handout. Following the year 1773, the column number 21 is given. Step 2. Turn to the page that shows column 21 at the top. Step 3. Under the column heading, Sundays, on the left, find the feast date name. The feast date in this example is the Sunday called Trinitatus. Step 4. The christening date we are looking for is the 16th Sunday after Trinitatus. Scroll down the list of Sundays under, under Trinitatus to the number 16. In the column to the right of the number 16, the date 26 September is given. So the calendar date of the feast date, Dominica 16 post Trinitatis, is September 26, 1773. This page, taken from a Christian record in 1622, lists seven different feast dates. The page to the right of the Christian record shows the highlight, highlighted feast dates written in Roman print. To the far right is a list of Sunday feast dates. The first feast date on the list is called Fasnacht. It is not listed on the Sunday feast date page. The second one is listed as Palm Tog or Palm Sunday. On the Sunday feast date page, it's listed as Palmyrum and was the Sunday before Easter. The third feast date is Osterdienstag or the Tuesday after Easter. After determining the date for Easter in 1622, Oster Dienstag would be just two days later. The fourth feast date is Quasimodo Geniti, which is the Sunday after Easter. The fifth e feast date is Exoti, which is the sixth Sunday after Easter. Going back to the feast date called Fasnacht, to determine the calendar date for it, we must use the following resource. The translated title is Handbook of the Reckoning of Time from the German Middle Ages to the Present. This resource was mentioned in webinar number two on German reference and research tools. In looking up, <clears throat> in looking up Fosnach in this book, it showed that it occurred on Dienstag or Tuesday after the feast day Sunday called Estomihi. Estomihi was the seventh Sunday before Ostern or Easter. After determining the calendar date for Estomihi in 1622, Fosnacht would be two days later. These last two are not feast days, but saint days. These are fixed dates. The first entry indicates the child was christened on the Sunday after John the Baptist, and the other one occurred on the day of Jacobi or James. So with both of these, you must first determine the calendar dates on which they occur. The handout included in this lecture is titled Saint Days, and it provides the calendar dates they occur on. In this enlargement of the page in the handout, it shows that John the Baptist date is June 24th. Because the child was christening on the Sunday after June 24th, you must first determine what day of the week June 24th was in 1622. The handout also shows that the day of James was July 25th. Going online, the following months of June and July were found for 1622. On the calendar for June, the 24th occurred on a Friday, so the child was christened on the next Sunday, June 26th. The record stated that the last child was christened on the day of Jacobi. That day was on Monday, July 25th. Calendar of the Early Middle Ages. This calendar was often used in German church records in the 17 and 1800s. This record shows two of these early Middle Ages dates as 
one being Brachmonat, which was June, and the other one is Hoinmonat, or July. In this Swiss record, there are different months for November and December. Wintermonat was November, and Wolfmonat was December. That was the time of the year wolves would come into villages looking for food. This next part of the lecture will focus on some of the cultural aspects of the German families pertaining to births, marriages, and deaths. A more in-depth discussion pertaining to their use will be given in webinars numbered 8, 9, and 10. A study of the birth, marriage, and death record statistics showed that of the total number of children born, about 37% of them died before the age of 10. Statistics also showed the high possibility that one or both parents passed away before their children were grown. The average number of children per couple is three, but the average number of children per family is five due to multiple marriages. At, at the death of either the husband or wife, the surviving spouse would remarry if the children were not full grown or if there was no one to do the task of the deceased spouse. Mortality rate of men and women was the same. Because of this, the percent of second and third marriages for men and women was also the same. The percent of children raised by a step-parent, 35%. Concerning births and christenings, I want to begin by talking about stillbirths. This is a birth record under the second column where it says Tafnamen des Kindes, christening name of the child. Below it, it says Tok Geborene Kanaba, a stillborn boy. Official documents have been found in some areas of Germany that authorize civil registrars and ministers to record the birth of children who died within a few days after birth as being stillborn thus saving them from having to create a birth record and then having to create a death record. And because of this, a stillbirth may have been a live birth. Another cultural fact that because families lived in the same locality for decades and even centuries, you will find a number of families with the same surname having children with the same or similar given names. Determining which children belong to which family can be a research problem that will be discussed in a later webinar. Illegitimacy, a cultural issue in Germany. In entry number two of this birth record from the Württemberg Parish of Brücken, it shows that Eva Barbara was the unehelich or illegitimate daughter of Eva Rosina, Johann Konrad Ottinger's unmarried daughter, on 11 February. 1847. In the German culture, the stigma of being illegitimate, being of illegitimate birth, remained with an individual for life unless it was legally changed. Concerning illegitimate births in Munich, Bavaria, in southern Germany, the following information was published in 1936 in the, the publication of the Bavarian National Association of Genealogical Family History. In one Munich parish district from 1820 to 1824, there were around 2,000 legitimate and 1,000 illegitimate children christened. In a neighboring parish district, the minister estimated that the number of illegitimacies had increased about nine times since 1770. In northern Germany, in Lamstadt, Hanover, the following shows that what percent of all marriages in each time period had a child born out of wedlock before their marriage? From 1701 to 1750, 13.3% of all marriages. From 1751 to 1800, 26.9% of all marriages over one-fourth of the marriages. From 1801 to 1855, or 1850, 35.9% of all marriages, or one-third of the marriages. 1851 to 1900, 44.7% of all marriages, nearly one-half of all marriages. An ordinance was established, and on 10 June 1826, approved by the Ministry of Justice, 
requiring the name of the father to be re recorded in the birth entry of illegitimate children if it was known. In 1677, a civil rights decree regarding illegitimate births stated, quote, It is the decision of the Bavarian Ministry of Justice that according to the civil rights decree of the general Bavarian and Prussian laws, illegitimate children would be under the status of the mother, and this according to the law established on 12 March 1677, changing an illegitimate to anything other than the mother's name can only be done with the permission of the government, end quote. The following marriage record from Lafayette, Missouri, shows that a Michael Kloss from Württemberg, Germany, and Emily Burkhardt from Lafayette were married on 20 August 1884. The Württemberg Immigration Index shows a Johann Michael Kloss was born 3 April 1841 in Brücken, Württemberg. In the Brücken Parish record on 3 April 1841, there is an entry for Johann Michael. Below his name is the word Unehli, showing that he was born out of wedlock. According to the law, he was given his mother's maiden name. The record shows his mother's name was Anna Margarita. She was the daughter of Johann Konrad Schröder, so Johann, Johann Michael's surname would also be Schröder. At the bottom of the page, the name of the father is given as Nikolaus Klaus. Below his name is the date, 30 May 1842, about a year after the birth of Michael, and this is the date that Nicholas Klaus had Johann Michael legitimized as his son. This was not done by the church, but by the local Amtsgericht or lower court. We need to understand how climate, the economy, and laws affected marriages and illegitimacies. This chart shows the, uh, shows the increase in illegitimacies between 17 and 1800. In the last webinar, I talked about Germany's Little Ice Age from 1500 to 1800. Because of the continuous inclement weather, there were more crop failures causing widespread famines. During this time, there were fewer marriages and more illegitimacies. In 1800, the government increased the cost of marriage. One in every 150 couples could afford marriage. Marriages decreased and illegitimacies increased. In 1850, the cost of marriage increased again. Now, one in every 250 couples could afford marriage. Marriages again decreased and illegitimacies, illegitimacies increased even more. Marriages. I want to talk about one of the cultural aspects of marriage. It didn't seem to matter whether a man and woman were living in the same parish at the time that they were married. But in Germany, it was common for marriages to be held in the parish where the wife was from. Because of this, where the family lived and where their children were born may not be the same place the parents were married. This map shows that the city of Molsum, highlighted in red, was in the northern Germany in the Prussian province of Hanover. The surrounding towns listed on the map are the places from where about half of the spouses of the people from Molsum were from. Finding the location of the marriage typically reveals the place where the wife's family was from. This is one of the major aspects in the basic research process that will be covered in webinar number eight. Two circumstances often brought couples together. In the first circumstance, the youth in their mid-teens after confirmation left Mulsum and their families to find work in other towns. In the second circumstance, youth from other places came to Mulsum to find work. In either case, it often resulted in their eventually meeting their future spouses. Marriages between kin. It is not unusual to trace different ancestral lines back to the same grandparents, great-grandparents, or second great-grandparents. In this example, the great-grandparents from two different family lines were the same couple. The two grandmothers, Maria and Ilseba, were sisters which made Joachim Heffenbrock and Hedwig Fahrenholz first cousins. 
I came across a periodical article that talked about intermarriages between families in small communities. The lines in this drawing indicate marriages that took place between families in this town. It caused me to wonder if this is true in larger communities as well. I did my own study using a much larger community, and the results were the same. Does this complicate your research? No, not if you, your research is accurate. It simplifies it. In extending one of the family lines as shown in this example, instead of having 16 different six, 16 different second great-grandparent lines to trace, there are only nine. The other seven are the same as those that are already listed. This is a result of Germany's feudal system, which limited population movement. It also implies that the further back you trace your ancestry, the more likely it is that someone may have connected to your lines and extended them without your knowledge. Webinar number seven will show how to check various compiled genealogies to prevent duplicating research. Death records and resources. Use of death records. Death records can be very useful in genealogical research. The following are just a few of the ways. Death records may provide material other than death and burial information. They may give the place, the birthplace of the de deceased if it's not the same place as the place of death. This is the death entry for Johann Philipp Müller. It gives the place of death as Brombach as shown in the lower right-hand corner of the map. The record also gives Johann Philipp's birthplace as Emmershausen shown in the upper left-hand corner of the map. If this death record had not given the place of birth, it may have been necessary to do an area search to find it. The process of doing an area search will be covered in webinar number six on using German maps and atlases. If the date of birth is not known, a death record may provide an approximate date of birth by giving the age at death in years, months, and days. This burial record showed that Henry Twiffel died on the 13th of April, 1795. It gave his age at death as 73 years, 5 months, and 3 weeks, or 21 days. By subtracting his age from the death date, it shows that he was born on or about the 22nd of October, 1721. Verifying an Ancestor's Birth Philip Lurve died November 1888, aged 74 years, which makes his birth year approximately 1814. His immigration records gave Dorfweil, Germany, as his place of birth. It's possible that two or more children with the same or similar name as the direct ancestor could be born in the same parish. A search of the Dorfweil Christian records from 1809 to 1816 identified three possibilities. Johann Philip, the son of Johann Philip Lerv and his wife Maria Elizabeth, Philip Jacob, the son of Johann Adam Lerv and his wife Anna Maria Hartmann, and Philip Jacob, the son of Johann Heinrich Lerv and his wife Maria Barbara Buhlmann. Statistics showed that up to 40% of the children died before the age of 10. A search of the Dorfweil death records identified a Johann Philip the son of Johann Philip Lerv, who died in 1810, aged seven months. Another entry was also found for Philip Jacob, the son of Johann Heinrich Lerv, aged three months. No death record was found for Philip Jacob Lerv, the son of Johann Adam Lerv. This verifies that Philip Jacob, the son of Johann Adam Lerv, was the direct ancestor. German funeral sermons are a resource that provide death information and more. They are called Lichenpredigen, or funeral sermons, and are like obituaries. A detailed description of them will be given in webinar number seven on using compiled genealogies. Church confirmation records. In Germany, confirmation was a major cultural event in the life of young men and, and women. After the confirmation, they began to be treated as adults and many of them left home to find work. 
This document shows the kind of information that may be found in a confirmation record. Column 1 gives the name of the one being confirmed. Column 2 gives their age. Column 3 gives the regular or feast date of the confirmation. Column 4 gives the father's name and occupation. And column 5 gives their residence. After confirmation in middle and upper middle class families, young men often enter into universities or into an apprenticeship. Next, I want to talk about the cultural aspects of occupations. Occupations influence where people live, who they married, the lives of their children, their standing in the community, the records in which they were recorded. Sometimes record keepers identified people by their occupation and not their surname. Some of the types of occupations included education, farming, labor, military, guilds, skilled, merchants, and government. The size of a town usually determined the type and number of the same type of businesses that were allowed. Some of the occupations were passed on from generation to generation, as shown in this example of the Erdsik organist family, Descending Pedigree. In his article, Zippenkunde der Deutschen Schule, Franz Heinz published what he called a Berufs Anentoffel or Occupational Pedigree Chart to show how occupations were passed on from one generation to another and how one type of occupation may have led to other kinds. Also, the later the generation, the less occupational and class distinctions mattered. Most christening records in the 1600s and 1700s give only the father's name and the name of the child. A problem occurs when there are two fathers by the same given and surname. This becomes evident when some of the children are born the same year, unless they're listed as twins, or one was born at the first of the year and the other is at the end of the year. So how do you determine which children belong to each family? If the occupation of the father is known, and if the occupations are not the same, as in this example, it makes it easier to know which children belong to each father. In the case of the occupation of farming, there was a separation of responsibilities between the farmer and the farmer's wife. His job was mostly out in the fields. If he is leasing land, he may have to work in the landowner's fields as well. His wife's responsibilities pertain to taking care of the farmhouse and the farmyard. This is an occupational record for a person by the name of Christian Auer. The first column gives a physical description of him, giving his age when he received his license at 16 years. Second column gives the date when he received his work license. Third column gives his place of residence and his father's name and occupation. The fourth column indicates he was married on 10 February 1865, and he has one son. Fifth his, gives his work history, identify who he worked for, where he worked, and when he worked for them between 1860 and 1867. Occupation of guilds. There are three types of guild records. The first is the apprenticeship records, as shown in this example from Kreuzberg, Ostpreußen, the Tischler or Carpentry Guild record. After completing three to four years of apprenticeship, the apprentice is presented with a certificate shown here in large. The certificate is presented by the guild master. It states that it is a Tischler or Carpentry Guild and gives the name of the apprentice as Johann August Kaiser. At the bottom of the certificate, it gives the place name of Königsberg, Prussia, and the date of the certificate as March 1837. It also has the guild seal. The second is the journeyman's records. After completing the apprenticeship, the journeyman travels for several years working for different masters, serving and learning from them. This entry shows that each master they served made a note in their book about their performance. The last is where they complete their masters. This is a Meister or master record book from Duderstadt, Hanover. 
This is taken from the Master Book of the Shoemaker Guild at Duderstadt in Hanover, Germany in 1819. It shows those who were entered in this book and the year they began their masters. Influence of Foreign Cultures The French influence on Germany's culture began in, with its occupation of Germany in 1792 to 1815. The following outline map of the German Empire of 1871 shows the various time periods when civil registration or the recording of vital records began for East German nobility and provincial area. The area west or left of the green line shows those areas that were occupied by France, including Baden in 1792. The Hessen areas were occupied in 1803, Westfalen in 1808, Hanover in 1809, and Oldenburg in 1811. In addition to establishing a civil registry in Germany, the French also introduced the French Republican calendar, as shown in this birth record. This record gives the French Republican calendar date as second of germinal in the second year of the Republic. The Gregorian calendar date for this entry is the 22nd of March, 1794. In France, in 1792, the days, months, and years were changed when the French Republican calendar was created. The first day of the calendar began on September 22, 1792, the day the French won their independence. This became one Vendemer in the first year of the Republic. Every month had three weeks, and every week had ten days. Twelve months with 30 days was 360 days. That left five to six extra days at the end of the year. These became what was called complementary days. The following handout on the French Republican calendar is included with this lecture. It enables you to convert a French Republican calendar date into a Gregorian calendar date. On the top row of the handout, Underlined in red, the years of the French Republic are given in Roman numerals. Below them are two rows underlined in blue of the Gregorian calendar years, beginning in 1792-1793. Under 1792, you have the months of September through December. Under 1793 are the months of January through August. As an example, we will use the French Republican calendar date of two germinal in the second year of the Republic. The month of germinal is underlined in green. The following are the steps to use in changing the French Republican calendar date of two germinal in the second year of the Republic to the Gregorian date. <clears throat> Step one, as shown in this example, the first thing we do is find the French, the French month of germinal in the left column. Step two, we find the second year of the Republic at the top of the page and go down to the year of 1794. Step three, we find the Gregorian month and day for one germinal shown in the columns to the right as March 21. For two germinal, we add one to the 21, changing it to the Gregorian date of 22 March 1794. How do you change a complementary day to the Gregorian date? In this example, I will change the third complementary day in the fifth year of the Republic to the Gregorian calendar date. Step one, determine the Gregorian year for the fifth year of the Republic. Using the complementary day section at the bottom of the handout, year five is found on the first line. Step two, to the right of the fifth year, the five complementary days are shown as September 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. The third complementary day is the 19th. Step three at the top of the handout page, it shows that September in the fifth year occurred in 1796, making the Gregorian date 19 September 1796. German area under Swedish rule. In the periodical Archive for Zippenforschung or Archive for Lineage Research, an article was published in volume 31 
issue 17 in February 1965, titled Dispensations Gesuche, und Heiraten, or Dis Dispensation Requests Concerning Marriages to Relatives. From 1720 to 1815, Sweden occupied the German area for Pullman, which is that part of Pullman west of the Oder River. The people in this area came under Swedish government and its laws. One of those laws prohibited getting married or being married to a close relative. If a person was married to a relative and wanted to remain married or wanted to marry a relative, they had to request a special dispensation. The page on the right is from an article in which the dispensation records were extracted and published for the years 1774 to 1778. The record gives the names of each couple. It identifies how the husband and wife were related. It, it, in the entries on this page, almost every person is married to the daughter of their father's brother or sister, which would make them first cousins. The record also gives the couple's marriage date. On this same page, we see that the law prohibiting marriages to relatives was no respecter of persons. The following shows that the occupation or status of each husband, Jacob Andreas Arendt, was a surgeon. David Albrecht Erdmann was a servant. Carl, Johann Karl Ulrich von Baer was a manor lord. Christian Benzin was a university student. Johann Friedrich Beringer was a farmer, and Avert Dill was a serf or peasant. This record included everyone from a manor lord to a serf, from a surgeon to a farmer, and from a, from a student to a servant. It included lower, middle, and upper classes. A major cultural aspect has to do with the various German naming practices. The following will be elaborated on in webinar number nine on resolving German naming problems. They will include patronymic names ending in S, E, N, S, and I, N, G. They will include also farm names, locality names used as surnames, occupations used as surnames, Latin form of surnames, orphan names. This concludes webinar number five of the series of 10 lectures on German genealogical research. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. We hope you will join us for our next webinar, which is on February 1st with James Tanner. He will be giving a presentation on how to fix damaged photos. A recording of this webinar will be made available next week. You can view that on our YouTube channel or on our website. If you have any comments or questions, you can always email us at fh underscore webinars at byu.edu or follow Facebook and Twitter. Thank you and have a wonderful week.